Hi, everyone, and thank you very much for joining us today. You're here for a webinar discussing the state of ocean freight procurement, but more specifically, whether tenders and RFQs are broken. I'm Mayan. I'm part of the marketing and research team here at Freitos. Here is a quick refresher or intro for some of you who aren't familiar with the complete Freitos ecosystem. Freitos provides a full technology stack for carriers, logistics providers, and shippers. Essentially what that means is we manage the flow of freight rates and prices from carriers through freight forwarders to shippers and then back upstream to freight forwarders and carriers. Within the Freitos group, Freitos offers a digital platform for importers and exporters, while Web Cargo is a suite of digital sales digitalization across both carriers and forwarders. I hope you guys all got that because it's quite a mouthful. <laughs> Going through our agenda today, we are going to, actually, I'll take a step back. We're actually going to go through some of the research that we've done. Uh, we've been focusing quite heavily on it for the past five years, specifically with regard to freight digitalization. We've had a couple of recent reports come out. Uh, they're all listed here on the slide. And if you go to the link at the bottom here, you can access all of them for free. So I highly encourage you to take some time and do that. Moving on today regarding what we're gonna cover, we are going to go through quite quickly a uh, background on tenders. We're going to discuss ocean freight volatility and, and what that means for the players. We're going to go through some of the survey results that we found and some of the insights that we thought were quite interesting. We'll go through some of the solutions that are being tried out today. We're then going to introduce the Freitos Baltic Index, which we've created in partnership with the Baltic Exchange and SGX, the Singapore Exchange. We're very lucky today to have our CEO, Svi Schreiber, to present. Svi is a serial entrepreneur who has been in the logistics space since before Freitos as an importer. He sold companies to both IBM and GE, but over the past seven years, he's been focused on building Freitos to change the face of digital logistics. Just a technical note, if you guys have any questions during the webinar, type them into the Q&A section and we'll get to them at the very end. We're also going to be emailing out the slide deck, so keep a lookout for that in your inbox. Without further ado, I'll hand it over to Fredo CEO, Svi Schreiber. Good. Thanks, Mayan, and uh, a big thanks to the Fredo's marketing and uh, research team who uh, did all the research, which we're going to be sharing with you. As, um, as Mayan said, we have a pretty active um, research agenda and, and always share our reports and insights with the uh, with the industry uh, as part of our effort to uh, partner with the industry on the on the road of digitization also opportunity to thank my colleague philip who's done a lot of work on the fbx which we're going to be, pre be presenting today so um I, I think we all know why you know the the majority of procurement by big shippers big bcos for ocean container freight uh, the majority is done with fixed price tenders or uh, tenders are also called RFQs or bids. I'm going to stick with the word tenders. Um, and they're typically annual or, or the smaller shippers, sometimes it's quarterly. And uh, the, there's an obvious benefit to having a fixed price tender. It allows the service provider, the carrier, the forwarder to lock in some revenue and capacity for the year. And it allows the shipper, the BCO, to lock in some prices, which helps them manage their budget for the year. So there's a, a clear attraction to both sides. Um, but we heard more and more anecdotes that this is not working well. And, you know, in my conversations with the industry, I heard more and more complaints from all the parties, from carriers, from forwarders, from shippers. And uh, that's what prompted us to, you know, we've done a lot of research in the past about spot quotes and the problems there and how manual they are and how slow they are. Uh, but this time we decided to look at the uh, tenders. And um, as we suspected, we found a lot of uh, issues. Uh, of course, uh, the service providers start by complaining about the effort and a lot of it uh, over the winter months and coming into, you know, a lot of the tenders are sort of wrapping up around now. And... Um, I spoke to a large uh, freight forwarder who has a team of 100 people just dealing with uh, tenders. Um, and the typical elapsed time on a tender is three or four months. There's often two or three rounds of negotiation. There are thousands of lanes. Uh, the Excel sheets get split up and emailed all around the world. 
and uh, really a very uh, substantial manual effort going on at the service providers, um, all of which is done without any guarantee of uh, success. In fact, win rates are quite low. So a service provider may spend many weeks or even months on um, doing a tender and may receive nothing or may be awarded just a few lanes. So that's the first complaint. Uh, but, but actually, the more significant issues are then, you know, with the operation of the tender during the year. Um, by way of background, it's, it's, I was quite interested. I, I didn't know this at all till, uh, till we did this research. Uh, I mean, I, I knew that the prices of container shipping fluctuate, and, and we all know that. They, they fluctuate seasonally. They fluctuate also uh, irrespective of the season. They fluctuate based on the supply and demand. Um, but what I didn't know is that actually um, our industry, container shipping, is much more volatile than many other um, commodities like aluminum or core, um, or corn or iron ore, um, or even more volatile than the S&P 500 share index. So we are dealing with a very volatile um, industry, and that's the background for people either wanting to fix the price using tenders or for some of the more sophisticated solutions that we're going to be uh, promoting. And um, although everyone knows there's a certain seasonality with a, with a peak typically around sort of September, October, and, and maybe another peak before Chinese New Year, um, the seasonality is not consistent. Just, just uh, as an example, if you look at the 12 months, um, the last 12 months to today, and then you look at the 12 months before that, uh, the pattern's really quite different. So there's a lot of jerky uh, short-term volatility and there's sort of also longer-term seasonal changes, um, but they don't necessarily follow exactly the same pattern uh, year on year. So um, our research team uh, went out to ask the industry about this. We spoke to 80, uh, we interviewed 80 people, um, of which about 40% were the BCOs or the shippers, about 60% uh, were forwarders and carriers, uh, mostly mostly forwarders. Um, the shippers were big ones, and most of them had more than half a billion dollar in revenue, and many of them had many uh, billions of dollars in revenues, uh, big uh, BCOs and big forwarders as well. And all of the people that we interviewed were director level and up, so it's very, very much an executive uh, survey. You can see here some examples of the uh, big BCOs who participated in our research, really a fantastic list of uh, famous sort of Fortune 500 companies. And then on the bottom two rows, you can also see many of the sort of top 20, uh, three PLs in the world participated in this research. And uh, many, many thanks to anyone on the call who did take the time to participate in, in our research. So what did we find out about those tenders, which, um, which all of us spend a lot of time time on and, and is the basis for most of our, you know, most of your procurement uh, strategies. Uh, first of all, the majority of the these really big enterprises in particular, the majority were tendering directly with the carriers, uh, but also about 10%, 11% with forwarders and 8% um, uh, with a 4PL. And then as you go to down market, probably there's a higher proportion with the forwarders. Um, and the number one um, conclusion and complaint, which we heard again and again, is that although you go through this whole effort to negotiate a fixed price, it is not necessarily uh, totally fixed. So um, when you ask the BCOs, they, they were saying that 20% of the shipment had some additional fee, which was not part of the fixed price that they had uh, budgeted for. Um, and then when you look at the forwarders, uh, they even, especially if you, if you zoom into peak season, 75% um, of forwarders were saying that they were passing through seasonal surcharges or other changes. So the fixed price was not, in fact, fixed, especially when it came to peak season. And that's really um, the irony of tenders. You know, the reason why you negotiate a tender at the beginning of the year is not because you need a fixed price during the, the low season, but um, BCOs are thinking ahead and trying to make sure that they lock in a low price so that they don't get hit with high prices during a peak season. But, but it turns out that when peak season comes along, in many, many cases, there are, in fact, uh, the, the tender is actually not being strictly honored with the fixed price, and there are various seasonal surcharges coming in. 
Um, there's, in fact, not just surcharges, but an actual renegotiation is happening in almost a third of cases, especially when there's a, a capacity crunch. Uh, and there are, in most cases, even from the beginning, there are in 60% in of tenders or 60% of respondents said that they were, they had either the bunker, the, the bath, you know, the bunker adjustment factor was floating um, or the seasonal surcharges. So, 60% of respondents said they knew in advance that uh, the tenders were not entirely fixed price and therefore didn't fully achieve their goal of allowing a, a budget. Um, and in fact, um, as we saw before, even the ones which were in theory fixed price sometimes are, are renegotiated. Uh, maybe um, the most important thing is not just the price, but the service. So um, a sort of staggering 66% of shipments on average, uh, the, the BCO said, are not arriving at the scheduled time. And BCOs are forced, therefore, to create extra stock, extra inventory at a, at a very high uh, very high cost of capital. Um, so that's a you know, fundamental problem for our industry. And again, the, the tenders actually, this I, I think is a, a critical point, that tenders make this worse because you know, BCOs lock in a price for the year. And then when it comes to peak season, um, capacity is tight. And if the BCO is able to keep the, the price capped, then that's all very well, but then the carrier may not prioritize their container. They may prefer a container which, which is being sold spot for a much higher price. So containers do get rolled in um, peak season, especially if they're being sold on a low fixed price. And that's really the fundamental problem with a tender. You lock in a price, uh, the price may not be fully locked, and if it is locked, then you may get hits with poor service in, in quite a lot of cases as well. Um, the final point before sort of summing up the impact, but the final point, which is uh, particularly from the carrier's perspective, uh, the, the thing the carrier most wants when they sell the tender is, is to lock up some of, the, some of their supply for the year. So they've got capacity to ship 10 million containers over the year, and, and they'll, they're delighted to close tenders for 5 million containers. And they know that half of their, you know, the ships are already half full for the year and the rest can be sold spot. Just, just as an example, uh, one of the real endemic problems of this industry is that the minimum quantities, the MOQs, are um, typically quite soft. And it's pretty common that a, a BCO or a forwarder is not, in fact, meeting the minimum quantity. And in almost, it's extremely rare that there's any penalties which are actually enforced. Um, there's actually a, um, a, sto a funny story where the exception, the only exception that I heard to that was actually when Hanjin went bankrupt a couple of years ago, um, the creditors of Hanjin uh, started going through some of the tenders and finding BCOs who owed money because they hadn't reached the MOQs. So Hanjin was bankrupt. They didn't care about the customer relationship. So that was an exceptional situation. But in the normal um, course of business, the carriers... Um, and forwarders are, are waiving MOQs uh, because they want to carry on the relationship and, and get the get more business the following year. Uh, but this is the you know from the carrier's perspective, this is the biggest problem with uh, tenders because you you lock in a low price because you want to um, you know firm up some some um, some revenue for the year and some uh, some of your capacity. And then um, in, in quite a lot of cases, the shippers actually aren't meeting those minimum quantities. So you're sort of giving the, the, the low price on false pretenses in a way. And that's a fairly common occurrence we found. Uh, overall, uh, BCOs um, and, and uh, forwarders felt that <clears throat> the um, issues around volatility are a significant impact to their bottom line. Uh, four out of 10 in importance on average. So it's not maybe the most a significant factor, but, but nonetheless a, a significant factor in their uh, profitability. I interestingly enough, um, the, from our, our research, the players who are most hurt by the challenges around fixed price tenders are actually the freight forwarders the, and the, the three PLs. Um, and the reason for that is that, um, and this chart here is uh, thanks to Transport Intelligence, who did some very nice uh, research on this. Um, and they compared the average freight rate 
um, to the gross profit margin of the forwarders. And as you can see, there's a very direct negative uh, correlation here. Whenever prices go up to 20%, uh, the freight forwarders are losing 2% of their, their gross profit margin. Uh, and the reason for this, of course, is that forwarders in many cases are being forced by the customer to sell on a fixed price tender, but in many cases they're buying floating price. So they really get squeezed when the, um, when the short-term rates go up and uh, they make it up when the short-term rates go down, uh, but they're taking a lot of risk here. And that's sort of doing the industry a service. They're, they're somehow shielding the BCO from part of the risk, um, but it creates quite a roller coaster in the forwarder's own gross profit on ocean shipping. So, um, you know, we did some research then on other industries, and here we were very much helped by our investor, the SGX, the Singapore Exchange. The Singapore Exchange is not just a stock exchange, but a, but a large exchange for commodities and derivatives. And um, with their help, we were able to do quite a lot of research on how other industries deal with the same problem. Um, before going into that, uh, we did ask people on the survey, you know, how are they using, how are they dealing with the, the, the risk? And uh, interestingly, quite a good number are dealing with, um, are, are sort of consulting analysts or analyst reports or experts uh, which is okay. I mean, it's good to consult experts, but it's really not as good as what's going on in other industries where they actually using direct data and using financial instruments to hedge the risk, which is almost unheard of, as you can see in our industry. So um, what does that look like? Let me tell you a little bit in, in first, first in abstract terms, how other industries have evolved. And then in the next slide, I'll show you in very real terms, you know, where other industries are at relative to uh, container shipping. So all the industries start like container shipping with a, a spot price, which is volatile, and that creates risks for the buyers and it creates <coughs> risk for the sellers. And then most industries indeed um, evolve a little bit like our industry already has to long-term contracts, which attempt to fix the price. And that goes well for a while, but then you know, when there's a, a particular, an unusual event, when capacity is very tight or when capacity is very loose, <coughs> excuse me, when capacity is very tight, then the carriers have a too big an incentive to try to add extra fees or to give lower service levels. And then, of course, when capacity is, is when there's overcapacity, prices are soft, then you get more and more of the buyers going off tender and um, and buying spots and, and then not meeting their minimum quantities. So the, um, the, the incentive to, for one side or the other, there's always one side or another who's trying to get out of the tender, depending if the spot market is, is high or low. And that's why other industries have then uh, evolved to the next stage where they don't try to fix the price, uh, but actually everyone pays the floating price. And that's, that way everyone's cargo is equally valuable to the carrier. Um, and then what they do is they use benchmarks and derivatives around those benchmarks to hedge their risk. Um, and that way they can use finan financial instruments to uh, achieve the same goal of predictable budget or predictable revenue. They can achieve that goal, but without trying to force a, a fixed price tender. And believe it or not, as you look at other industries, you'll see that almost all the industries in the world have matured along that roadmap much more than our industry, than container freight. Um, the only industry which is really sort of less evolved than us, according to SGX research, is uh, uranium, which is a pretty niche or, or niche market, obviously, with all the regulation that, that there is around uranium. Um, but you can see all kinds of um, commodities, uh, obviously gold and uh, aluminum, but also power, you know, electricity and natural gas and palm oil um, and uh, bulk freight. Uh, our sister industry, bulk freight, right in the middle of the slide there is, is way more advanced than container freight in the uh, level of sophistication. They've had derivatives and people have been paying floating price and hedging their risk very effectively for many years. Um, so it, it just puts this in context to, you know, where we are compared to other industries. Even, uh, even chickens is an example of an industry which has a sophisticated benchmarks with the price of poultry per kilogram. 
and um, you know has the kind of uh, sophistication which we're only just starting to have in our industry. There are many, many. We, we just picked this example as uh, at random, but there are many, many examples where industries were able to use financial hedging to um, cover their risk in, a, in an effective way. Uh, uh, one good example was Southwest, who actually uh, hedged their uh, cost of fuel. Now, I think most airlines do that, I believe, but they were perhaps one of the early ones to do that. And they started the trend because they were able to, they, they always pay the market rate for fuel, but they were able to use a, a forward um, or a, a derivative to hedge their risk against prices going up. And in 2001 to 2003, they saved $300 million by hedging this price. So even though the even though the price was floating, they were able to use derivatives to cover their risk. And they saved a fortune. And, and I think many other airlines have followed suit. Okay, so if I can have on the next slide. Give me a second here, my slides got a little bit stuck. Okay, so um, I'm not gonna go into any detail about derivatives here because I don't wanna get technical on this call. Um, some of you may be familiar with uh, options and futures from, from the stock market or, or elsewhere, but the idea is really very simple. The idea of a forward uh, freight agreement, which already exists in bulk, is um, to cover both risks and, and you know, if, if the industry moves to floating price, then the carriers have got a risk in case prices go down and it hits their revenue. And the BCOs have got a risk in case prices go up and it hits their costs. And the forwarders, depending, you know, if they're sort of long or short, they may have a risk in either direction. Usually, um, usually their revenue would be tied to the price of freight, so they would lose revenue if prices go down. So what the derivative markets allow in, in most other industries is for people to swap their risks. So there's a carrier who's got a risk if prices go down and there's a BCO who's got a risk if prices go up and they're able to swap that risk with each other. So, so that, that would be a swap or they can use FFAs, uh, which is a, a slightly different derivative. Either way, what happens is that the, there's somebody who's worried about prices going down, there's someone else about worried about prices going up and they're able to cover their risk with each other and both come out uh, protected. Even though they're going to pay the floating price, the financial instrument will compensate, compensate them if the price goes in the wrong direction. So um, we asked in our survey about this, we were quite curious whether um, people in the industry um, are in agreement with us that this is a good direction for the industry. And actually the, the results were fairly encouraging, I would say. So this was asking people, do they think they'll be using index link prices in five years. Um, by the way, uh, there are already tenders, of course, which are index linked. Um, we see estimates of around 15%, although um, that's not an accurate number, but probably about 15% of container tenders are already index linked uh, and floating price. Um, but uh, most of the respondents, you can see that most of the respondents were, were scoring sort of five to nine um, in this survey. So most respondents felt uh, confident that, um, at least optimistic or even confident in some cases, that they would be using indexing prices in the coming years. So that was sort of encouraging that many people in the industry do understand, you know, the, the direction that industries evolve. Um, if we average, you know, how many percent of the contracts would be index linked? I mean, honestly, we got answers all the way from 0% to 100% and then a lot of stuff in between the consensus was, was around 44%, so almost half. And, um, you know, like, like we said before, the people responding here are many of the leaders in the industry. So if they feel that half the contracts are going to be index linked, these are the people who are going to make it happen. So uh, that number should be taken very seriously. Well, very good. So that uh, brings me to the last part of the presentation. Up to now, um, we've been talking about our research. We didn't talk, um, didn't say anything about what Freitas is doing. Um, but allow me now at the end of the presentation to tell you a little bit about what we're doing in partnership with the Baltic Exchange. Uh, for those who don't know, the Baltic Exchange is a 200-year-old uh, London institution. Uh, for, for the longest time, it's got nothing to do with the Baltics anymore, and it's a worldwide um, organization which provides the indexes and benchmarks for bulk shipping. So if you want to charter a container or, or a bulk 
a ship, bulk freight ship, then um, you're going to be using the Baltic Exchange indexes to figure out the price. And they have derivatives and they've got active trade where, where ship owners are trading their risk against the shippers. And those are traded, of course, on the SGX as well as elsewhere. SGX, the Singapore Exchange, being now the owner of the Baltic Exchange, as well as an investor in us and Freitas. So in partnership with those organizations, we created the Freitas Baltic Index. Um, you can see it for free. At least the weekly version is free at fbx.freitas.com. We've recently launched a daily index. So this is the only daily index in the industry. Um, that's um, actually for pay, although we're happy to give a, a few month uh, free trial. So feel free to email us if you'd like to get a, a free trial of that. Um, and it covers, as you can see here, and you can also see on the web, on the site, fbx.fredos.com, it covers 12 major trade lanes. Um, and it covers, it basically publishes the price, the median price for a 40 foot container, uh, port to port on those trade lanes. So it's as simple as that. It gives you the average price to ship a 40 foot container from China to the US West Coast, from China to the US East Coast, from transatlantic, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and it's updated every day. I'll tell you a bit more about the methodology um, in a second. The daily, as I said, is now in beta. You can, uh, I believe, request access on the, on the site um, and uh, we'll be happy to give you a, a free trial of that. The weekly results is uh, the weekly index is published for free. Uh, there's also some nice analytics, which you can see examples on the left side. Um, these are the 12 trade lanes. Um, so, in, you know, in contrast to the Shanghai index, for example, which only gives you um, Shanghai, we, we do have other major trade lanes, uh, transatlantic um, and uh, South America. And we hope to add even more um, in the future. Um, so how do you use this? And then I'm also going to tell you a little bit more about how we calculate uh, the index. But the way you use it is quite simple. And, and we do encourage people, even if you don't want to perhaps move all your tenders to index linking in one go, that would be a little extreme. But um, we do know some uh, big uh, BCOs who are experimenting with just a couple of trade lanes this year to see how index linking works for them. Uh, and basically, the idea is that you fix a price based on FBX. So you say, I will pay FBX minus, depending how big you are, you know, if you, depending on your bargaining power, maybe you can pay FBX minus 10%, FBX minus 20%. That's a matter of negotiation. So you can still use your buying power to get a good discount, but the price will fluctuate with the FBX and you can decide if it adjusts every month or every week or every quarter. I believe that monthly would be pretty common for this. Um, and, um, and, and that way, you're always paying market price. You're all, always getting the, the discount that you deserve as a big shipper. Um, and your containers are not getting, getting rolled so much because you're paying market price at, the, at peak season. Um, and an, another huge advantage, uh, we didn't put this in writing in the slide, but a huge advantage of index linking is then you can negotiate the tender for two or three years. Uh, with fixed price, you're never going to do that because nobody can predict what is a reasonable fixed price two or three years ago. People are too scared to negotiate fixed price for more than a maximum of a year. But if you're index linking, then both sides are protected that the price will adjust in a reasonable way. And uh, a big advantage is that you can lock in um, a tender for two or three years instead of going through that huge negotiation every year, and uh, both sides are protected that they, they'll pay a, fair, you know, pay a fair price. It's a, bit, a little bit like a rental agreement, which adjusts based on market assessments. So why should you trust the FBX? Of course, if you're going to link your tender to the FBX, you do need to know that um, it's got a reliable methodology. Um, so, um, you know, we actually, unlike uh, some other indexes who just poll, just sort of do a poll, uh, and in their case, there's actually quite a risk because they're asking people to submit data for the index, but those people would be able to potentially manipulate and, and choose which data they submit. Uh, so that's not the, that's how a lot of indexes work, but they're, they're, those are always subject to manipulation. Uh, in Freitas, in fact, we have our rate management uh, system, Freitas Accelerate, where we manage rates for many, many forwarders. 
almost all of whom allow us to use their rates for statistical purposes. So these rates are real private rates between carriers and forwarders, which we, which we update um, every day. So every day we're, we're loading in dozens of Excels from many carriers, from, from you know, hundreds of carriers, hundreds of forwarders, um, and um, it mentions here airlines, but of course that's not for the FBX. Um, and we tend to have 400,000 different combinations and, and uh, overall a couple of billion uh, price points. So it's a very, very large data database and a very diverse database with many carriers and, um, and you know, forwarders, buyers and sellers represented. And uh, we track those short-term rates on a daily basis. And our, you know, our methodology is very uh, transparent. Uh, we tell you exactly how we calculate it. We use a very large uh, database, which is not submitted for its business data, its actual business data, and not sort of submitted specifically for the uh, index purposes. Um, and we're very transparent about methodology. So you can find on our site information about exactly how we, um, how we calculate this. And additionally, um, we, together with the uh, SGX and the Baltic, we're creating a council of industry experts who uh, meet regularly to oversee the index and make sure it represents um, the uh, you know the an accurate reflection of the price. So that's uh, up and running, and you're welcome to uh, use that. And then, of course, the next step, probably next year, would be the futures. So the uh, futures or forwards or swaps, the derivatives, which will allow you to um, hedge the risk. But for now, uh, we do see we do get strong confirmation from the industry and certainly from other industries that the direction is towards index linking. We believe that we have provided the uh, industry now with a very reliable index for the purpose of index linking. And we do encourage you to at least experiment with a, with a couple of index linked uh, lanes uh, this year. And then next year, we'll talk about the financial instruments that can be used to, um, to hedge the risk. Very good. Well, that brings us uh, almost to the second to 35 minutes past the hour. So we're right on schedule and we're going to take some of your questions now. Great. Thank you, Tzvi. We've got a few questions here. Um, the first one I'm going to start with is essentially, how does the FBX compare to Shanghai and Zanata, for instance? So, um, yeah, I, I mentioned slightly Shanghai before. Um, so, um, I won't speak for them, you know, but but I'll just say at a at high level, Shanghai A is just for Shanghai, so it's um, geographically much more limited. Of course, uh, Shanghai is an important port, so uh, that covers, but still, most of the world's freight isn't coming out of uh, China. Um, and so um, it's geographically limited, and we also believe that the methodology is a lot less robust. It is based on polling people, so... That does mean that although generally it gives good data, but it is um, susceptible to manipulation. People being polled could submit the wrong data or they could choose which data to submit. And also the amount of data is much less. So we do believe that we have a more comprehensive and a more reliable index, as well as the fact, of course, that we publish daily rather than uh, weekly. Um, Zenator is a you know important player uh, in the industry. Uh, I do believe, though, their um, core expertise is around benchmarking the, the tenders themselves, uh, and we don't compete with that in any way. So if you want to get market intelligence about you know, how much you should pay uh, for a fixed-price tender, then uh, the nature is a great source of, of market intelligence on that. Uh, but we believe that we have by far the most uh, comprehensive and reliable index for short-term rates. And we believe that the direction of the industry, for all the reasons that I said before, the direction of the in uh, industry is towards uh, floating price and uh, index linking. Thanks. Um, you touched on this a little bit, but we have another question um, asking essentially if you can tell us where the data comes from the index. Yeah, so um, this data is coming from, we, we have a um, web car, we own a company called Web Cargo, who have a company called Web, who have a product called Web Cargo Accelerate which is used as the rate repository by, by a large number of um, forwarders and also some large BCOs. Um, and um, so we, we actually are managing this data. And of course, the, the data itself is private, but we do have the rights to do a statistical analysis on that data. Um, and, uh, you know, some, some of the biggest 
forwarders in the world are, are using this, uh, you know, Nippon Express, yeah, Robinson, Gefco, uh, Siva in some countries, um, etc. So, uh, and, and many others as well. Those are just some of the more famous names. So, it's a very large and comp- comprehensive database, and it's entirely secure and private, but um, we do have the right to use an average, and w- which we then feed back to our customers. So, we help our customers and we help the industry at large to track the, the trends that way. Great. Um, another question that just came in is, uh, wasn't there a previous attempt to create derivatives for container shipping? Yeah, there was, I believe. It was before I was actually in the industry directly, but I believe that Morgan Stanley and a couple of other parties uh, had a go at this quite some years ago. Um, I, I believe, though, that um, to a large extent it's, fell over because there was not a, a truly reliable index at that point. And uh, we believe now with the FBX, we have a benchmark which is really um, suitable as an underlying for the uh, financial instruments. So uh, we're, we're confident that now's uh, a good time. Uh, by the way, if it's any indication, just a, f- a few weeks ago, uh, derivative trading launched for US trucking, which is a sort of a sister industry of ours, also a, also a freight industry. And a company called Freight Waves, together with their partners, launched trading, I believe, just three weeks ago for derivatives for U.S. trucking. So uh, that's another positive indication that the freight industry at large is ready for this kind of uh, instrument. Great. I think we have time for a few more. Uh, we have a question asking, how does price being fixed on an index allow for customers to budget long term for freight costs? Yeah. Um, so. Yeah, exactly. And then they add, protects the forwarders more. Yeah. Um, so, as in other industries, the, the key to protecting the uh, price and the budgeting is the derivatives. So, um, in the other industries I mentioned, they're, they're, they're paying floating price, but then they actually buy um, an option, which is like an insurance. You know, the, the derivative or the option is like an insurance, which says, if the price goes over my budget, I will be compensated. So you're actually, even when you go index linked, and and even though your price is fluctuating, you're able to fully protect yourself with a derivative against the price going high. And you you can absolutely protect your budget um, by buying this uh, future or option, which are, in the end, function like an insurance, which protects you against the price going up. So, yeah, fully understand that BCOs need to protect their budget. And on the other hand, Forwarders need to protect their buy-sell spread and carriers need to protect from the price going down. All of that is fully possible um, in an index-linked environment by using derivatives. Now, I appreciate that as of this year, we, we now have indexes in the industry. We have the FBX and we don't yet have derivatives. So I think the question here is a, is a great question um, in the short term. And that's why in the short term, we'd still recommend to only ind- index link some lanes not too many, so you don't have too much exposure. Um, but then we hope by next year we can actually provide derivatives where you can index link and protect yourself. So get the best of both worlds in that way. Uh, a few more, and then we're going to wrap it up as we're conscious of everybody's time. Uh, we have a question which is asking about uh, due to depressed freight rates, now carriers are treating container detention and demurrage as a source of income. Private terminals are also using storage and containers port demurrage as a source of extra income. Essentially, how uh, should shippers get maximum awareness about their their rights? Well, that's a great question. Sort of, it's tangential a little bit to the tender. Well, yeah, I mean, it, it is related because, of course, um, you know, detention and demurrage are are another example of surcharges which uh, which may hit you unexpectedly. Um, and so um, it, it is very important when you're negotiating a tender, it doesn't even matter if it's fixed price or floating price, but you do need to know exactly what your rights are and how many free, you know, free days you're going to get at the port and, um, and after what time you're going to be hit with extra surcharges. So that's another area where sometimes contracts are a little bit informal, but I, I do recommend whether you're buying spot or tender fixed price or tender floating price. In all those cases, you do need to watch the eye, you know, dot the I's and cross the T's in terms of, you know, in terms of how many uh, days you get and, and your other rights. 
And then we're going to close with a, a last question here, which is asking about, um, is there an index specific to reefer containers? Yeah, that, that is a great question. Uh, unfortunately, we do not have that right now. Um, we are going to uh, look at expanding the index uh, for reefers and, and you know, um, sort of other value-add services. Um, we, we may also do some research to see the typical ratio. So it could be that you could still use reefer containers, but, but maybe you'd add a surcharge. So, for example, if you're shipping dry and you've got some buying power, you may, you may expect to pay FBX minus 20%. But then for a reefer, you may pay a higher amount. So we do, we do believe that the price of a reefer is closely linked to the price of dry. And therefore, it's quite feasible to um, still use the FBX and, and just add some extra price for the reefer. Um, but I think that's a great idea for uh, some of our next researchers to check what's the typical ratio between reefer and dry. And so I appreciate the question. And that definitely gives me an idea for something we should be working on. I did get the other day a similar question whether we have FBX for a 24 container and we do we do not although we do know typically you know what the ratio is between a 20 foot and a 40 foot so people could either use that ratio but maybe in future we'll actually add some more permutations to our indexes. Thank you. Thank you Tzvi. Uh, thank you again for taking the time to share with us this information and thank you for all of you who have joined us. Again, I encourage you to, to visit our uh, research page and check out some of the latest reports.